This is Drom Shakasuto. Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe and like this video. In every generation, the, the people, they have a different job. Like that, when you want to build a house, you have a building to complete. So every person, every professional person you'll bring to the house to work for you to complete the mission will do something else. One will dig, one will flat the area, one will, will put the foundations, one will put the cement, one will put the stones, one brick after the other, first floor, second floor, third floor. One will come and then start drilling and one will come put the electricity, everyone will come, one will start plastering, painting, putting the, the, the tiles. And then that um, fancy one will come and will design your house, will put the furniture and, and whatever. And then you need to come and start making Shlom Bait, like <laughs> a nice house, okay. It was better to be ruined, to leave it as a, as a, as a wild field if you won't work on the Shlom Bait and peace in the house and in, in, in that piece of stone that, that you, you went into to live in. If you won't bring the spirit into the house, so what's the worth, what's the use of having all that house? So every builder, every worker, every generation received a different job from heaven. Rabbi Nachman of Breslev he told us a story, one of the tales, one of his stories is a story that Rabbi Nachman of Breslev did not complete that tale on the seven beggars. And he was talking about the last beggar, that he was the most righteous one of them all. He had the most ancient, old, deepest memory going to a place that is so early that it's before of time even. He remembered things from before time. Now on him Rabbi Nachman of Weslev is not completing the tale, he's not telling us exactly his work and what that he's doing. But he is telling us that that battler, that that beggar doesn't have no legs. Now on all the rest of the beggars, when Rabbi Nachman is telling us what was their default, their defect, their problem, in the end of their story we understand that what that seemed to us as their default really is their praise, really is their success, that's their real power. The one that had a very bent neck, throat, in the end we saw that he is the most wonderful singer and he's able to make sounds that no one else in the world is able to make those sounds. And the ones that didn't have, um, the one that was, um, that his back was, was bent, so in the end we saw that his back was just carrying huge amounts of, of, of things on his back in a way that no one else was able to. So that one that it seemed to us that he's not able to move, that he's so stuck, he doesn't have legs. He's the one that is actually flying and he's achieving things that no one else is able to achieve. Today, You know, everyone is taking his scratches and bringing them to Avodat Hashem, to serve Hashem with his scratches. What can we do? We are like, who we are. So today, while I was thinking about Batman, because everyone is bringing his scratches to Avodat Hashem, so I was thinking that even Batman, let's say that Batman really would be in the world with us. Okay, now, okay, everyone are waiting for Batman. 
What Batman can do? What can he do? What we saw that Batman did. Okay, what Batman did? What? He can fly and save one person not to be robbed. He can help one person that thieves won't break into his house. He can save one person in another night that he won't be murdered in the street. Okay, great, amazing, fantastic things. He's able to help individuals. Okay, let's put him aside. Superman. Superman is even greater than Batman. Superman is able to make wonders in the world. He can fly faster than a speeding bullet, right? He is such a fast flyer. He can do amazing things. He can save hundreds of people. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Superman. Today, like we know, he's sitting in a wheelchair. He's not really able to save the world because he's also really able to go and save individuals. Even those ones that we will think to ourselves, oh, they have superpowers, they are rich, they are billionaires, they are so powerful, they are so strong, talented, gifted. If I would have his power, if I would have his money, if I would have his talent, I would do this, I would do that. If you go deep and look and search, you will understand that they are so limited, that their hands are so tight, and what that we receive today in our generation, is much more powerful and much greater than all the gifts that all those superheroes, so to speak, received. Why? Because we received internet. We received social media. Today I can speak to you and after every class I hear it. I'm receiving those comments from people. If it's students that are coming to my classes, if it's students that are watching my classes online, I receive hundreds of emails and messages and comments and words from live people in front of me coming to tell me in the end of the class, you were talking directly to me. This is a message that I think that most of my students experienced while watching my classes now. I promise to you that I don't have a clue how Hashem is doing it. I'm not controlling that. I don't have the mind to plan something like that. Like, I don't know the number of my shoes if you ask me. I'm just coming and being honest and aiming my heart to the truth and being sincere and as truthful as I can and as open and sensitive and caring as I can. And Hashem is taking my words and bringing them into the hearts of people and changing their lives. Now, this is much more powerful than Superman's power or Batman's power because they can help a person physically. They can save him from death, from an accident. They cannot save his spiritual life. They cannot help him to build his self-esteem. And also, they, if let's say there exists, they're able to help individuals and we can reach out to thousands and thousands of people live if it's on Facebook, if it's on YouTube live, if it's on all social media outlets. The power and the blessing and the gift that we received from heaven, it's not us, it's not our talent, it's not our power. If there will be no service, we can't do anything. If there's no Wi-Fi, you can't move. But Hashem, He made it happen to us today. He gave us this gift that we will have that ability to reach out to the houses and to the iPhones, to the computers, to the iPads of every person in the universe. I have students in such foreign places that you won't believe that there is internet in those places. And they're watching the classes, and they're asking questions, and they're begging for, for, for salvation, and for more support, and when love you will come to this place, and when you'll come to that place. People from places that you wouldn't, wouldn't even cross your mind to think that those places are communicating. And souls are waking up to ask for the truth. Now, I'm asking you, why Hashem gave us those tools? Why Hashem gave us that power today in this generation if not for that purpose
to wake up all the souls to know the Creator and to achieve this completion of a complete redemption to the wide world. 50 years ago, 20 years ago, there was no internet in the world. You couldn't communicate. 60 years ago, if you wanted to make a phone call, you would have, you, you would have a, a, a service, like you, uh, an operation. You would pick up the phone. 60 years ago, you would pick up the phone and you would hear your neighbor, he's talking. You have to hang up and wait another 5 minutes, 10 minutes. When he will finish his phone call, then you'll be able to dial. If someone else won't be, won't be faster than you and will dial. And we, when we, like 20 years ago, we had those crazy phones that you had to dial in circles and we had to wait until they'll finish their circle. Give that phone to my child to then tell him what to do with it. He doesn't know what to do with it. He can't dial. He won't understand how to dial in that, in that device. He, like he would never figure out how, what to do with that. It doesn't work. And today, Siri, call Mary, Go Mary Goldson. That's it, like that's it. <laughs> You don't need to do anything. You can clap your hands, electricity turns on. You want to talk to thousands of people, you Facebook Live, you're out there in the world. Hashem is making those wonders to happen for a purpose, for a reason, and we need to believe in that reason. That reason is a very specific reason. It's not the redemption. Because I can also broadcast, not me, but a person can broadcast classes and content that can destroy those houses in the same time. You can send swords and arrows and mistakes and darkness online that will demolish and ruin thousands and millions of houses in the same speed that you can revive them and give them life. <coughs> The purpose of all the social media and the internet that we received is that people will come back to their true selves and I'll tell you why. If you will check your phone and you will see what you put for yourself on your phone, you will see that you have yourself over there on your phone. You have the certain apps that you're using you have your contacts, you have your emails over there. If you like YouTube, so you can subscribe to the channels that you like. If you have Facebook, so you're liking and you're sharing the posts that you feel connected and you're signing up to those channels that are waking you up if you're connected to the social media in a positive way. And you are finding yourself in your mobile. You're finding yourself in front of the computer when you are positive about using it, when you are using it wisely. You can find yourself inside this device even though that this device can be lethal, can be so dangerous to you. But the Creator gave to your hand that weapon, that sword. It's a flipping sword that can let you in to heaven and can cut you to pieces if you go in the wrong direction. It depends on the intention of your heart. This is why I'm not coming and claiming and not trying to teach Torah and not claiming to be a rabbi. I'm not a qualified rabbi. I never received no smicha from no one or whatever. Righteous people did approve my work, did express their appreciation send me to my mission and on and on and I have many stories to tell you if you care about those things but today I'm not putting my mind to it at all I'm not looking back I just realized that I'm a person in a mission on a mission and I'm just trying to do my work and my work is not to teach Torah and not to teach you what is the path of Judaism and not what is the right way and for sure not to help you to save yourself from the wrong way. I'm just trying to wake you up to share with you from my journey of my self-awakeness 
how I am finding my true self, how I'm realizing what is the real purpose of my creation, why the Creator created me, for what. And I'm sharing that with you, with my friends, with my students, that they will find themselves, not that they will follow me. There's no way to follow me. There is only a way to find yourselves. And that is my teaching. This is what that I'm trying to tell you. Because this is the real purpose of creation. That the Creator, He already treasured inside of you all the treasures, the good stones, the diamonds, the precious qualities that are needed and required for your success. The Creator already sent you with the wisdom and the sensitivity and the power to achieve your goals. And that you will find and achieve true happiness. And going to complete your faith and your self-confidence. That you will build your self-esteem. And no one in the world can give it to you. And no one in the world will give it to you. You need to find it yourself. You must fight for yourself and then you will find it. Like many verses are saying. And many righteous people were talking about those concepts many, many times. And in earlier generations before. The reason why the Creator is hiding Himself from us is that we will work hard to shine the light of our own souls. Because people today became so lazy that they're thinking to themselves, you know what, I'll become religion, religious, and then I'll have salvation. I'll keep Shabbat, I'll eat kosher food, I'm even going to force my wife to go to Mikveh, and that's it. And to do the problems. For sure, guaranteed to me to be rich, to be wealthy, to be healthy. Stories, right? We're all keeping Shabbat, we're all eating kosher, we're all putting tefillin, we're all covering our heads, we're all doing everything we can. Where's the money? Where's the money? Where's the cash? Where's the money? Where's the happiness? Where's the confidence? Where's the joy? Where's the satisfaction from life? Where is it? Where is the inspiration? Where is the light? The guarantee, that promised light, where is it? Fell between the fingers. Fell between the seats, between the chairs, between the cracks. Where is it? You're giving your mice some money for charity, and you're working like a donkey, and you're keeping Shabbat, and you're not working, and you're not checking your emails, and you're running like crazy, and you're praying early in the morning, and you're putting your tefillin, and even Rabbi Nutan, and you're learning to halachot every day, and you're running, and you're t learning more, and you're doing more, and extra, and adding, and trying to accomplish more, and then you totally losing your mind and start closing your eyes and going to Rabbi Nachman of Breslev and saying Tikkun Aklali and washing your hands and doing this and doing that and charity before of this and charity before of that and reading and saying and running and everything is so fast and crazy and in the end of the day you look at the sorrow, sad, depressed face of your wife and you can't understand where is the blessing, what's going on. Like I'm sweating like an animal, I'm running like crazy I'm faster than a speeding bullet. I'm doing whatever I can and more than that. I'm giving $10,000 to that rabbi and $5,000 to that institute. I'm giving another 360 every month to that organization. In the end of the day, I can't pay my mortgage. In the end of the day, my wife, she asks for something and I can't cover my expenses. So where is the blessing? What's going on? Something is very wrong here, right? We all been promised that if we will serve Hashem, that if we will follow His rules, that if we will keep His will, that if we will do whatever He'll tell us to do, we will see wonders, we will see miracles. Where are they? Cannot complain on ourselves, really, all day long. I'm the worst, I'm worthless, I'm hopeless, I'm lousy. Why? I'm not learning enough, I'm not praying enough, probably I'm not guarding my eyes because I messed up here, messed up... You're not an angel, you're a human being. And as a human being, you have your weaknesses and your lackings, and you're not supposed to ignore that because on the Creator it's written and been said that He knows our inclinations, He's aware to our defects. 
So he must understand that for us it's hard not to sleep at night and then to work like an animal in the next day and to do it for six days a week like a machine, right? You cannot go to sleep because you haven't catch a minion and you have to pray in ten. Great, wonderful. And it's not good to do it in your house, so you must go in a synagogue and then you go. And then you come back home late and you need to spend some time with your wife. Another one hour, one half an hour, one hour and a half. Great. Now, midnight, you must say Tikkun Chatzot. You read Tikkun Chatzot before you go to sleep. You need to read it from the Siddur, right? You cannot say it by heart. Don't want to miss something, chas v'shalom, holy letters. They have power. You sit and you say, Kiyat Shema Shalemita. Another 20 minutes, Kiyat Shema Shalemita. I remember myself in the first days of my tshuva. My wife, she wouldn't speak to me. She said, go marry your siddur, go marry your rabbi. Leave me alone. I was running separate life from my wife that I just got married to because I wanted to succeed. Crazy. This is sick. If something is separating you from your soulmate, from your best friend in the world, something is totally wrong here. No, but people are saying that you need to wake up before of dawn and that you have to catch the mikveh before you pray and that you must say kol banot before you stand. Of course. What? You're going to say kol banot after? One hour every morning you need to wake up before of dawn and then you need to go to the mikveh another half an hour and then you need to catch a minyan another one hour. And how are you going to leave the synagogue if there is a learning over there? People are learning. Shnai mikra v'echad targum. Chok Israel. People are sitting and learning in such an excitement. Such a pleasure. I must be part of that, right? So she must wake up and she must take the kids to school and kindergarten and she must do something with her life and how come she is so lazy? And you start separating your life from the life of your beloved ones. How can it be? Something is awkward, something is twisted and something is wrong. So now, of course, those silly crazy ones will say, look at him. Look at Dror Kasuto, what he's doing. He's talking against the Torah. He's talking against learning. He's talking against praying in a minyan. He's talking against doing all the things that we're commanded to do, right? So why Dror Kasuto is so crazy? Oh, they're going to say that I'm a messianic. What are they going to say about me now? <laughs> Hiding myself, pretending to be a Jew. All right. My grandmother from the Holocaust, she will tell you on our roots in Judaism. I'm not rejecting no one from serving Hashem. I'm not spending one moment in my life, and I can swear to you on that, without throwing myself into fire, into water for Hashem it Barach. My mornings, I wake up only for Hashem. I got married for Hashem. I brought children to the world for Hashem. I'm making every moment of my life dedicated to Hashem. Even when I'm thinking about Batman, you can never imagine how I'm thinking about Batman and what I'm thinking of. <clears throat> because that's me. And I'm a flaming fire that is serving Hashem Barach every moment of my life. I'm not waiting for someone else to wake me up. I'm throwing myself out of bed. I'm throwing myself into the learning. I'm throwing myself into the prayer. Righteous people testified on me that I received Yirat Shamaim Shlema, real Amitit Yirat Shamaim, fear from heaven, complete and real fear from heaven, because of thousands of hours of Yidbodadut, of individual prayer. Now, I can tell you how I achieved those hours. Real thousands of hours that I took myself out of the house in the middle of the night or in the evenings and spend six hours and eight hours and nine hours one night after the other. So for three months every day I would drive from Jerusalem to Beit Shemesh to the grave of uh, Shinshon Gibor on the mountain. A few times I was scared to do it alone so I would take friends with me and then when I realized that I'm just enjoying and having fun over there and praying to Hashem I would go alone. And I would do that for three months every night. My wife will testify. You want me to call her? She's here. <laughs> every night I would go. 
for six hours, for four hours, and talking in the middle of the night for hours. Shimshon Agibo. And then I heard that the grave of Dan is also over there in Bet Shemesh. So I stopped going to Shimshon Agibo. And then I realized that that road is the same road. And in certain nights, I would make those two graves in the same night and would pray and pray alone at night. And then I found out another place on another place and another grave of a righteous man and another place. And if I wouldn't have no idea where to go to, I would go to the desert. And one time I would take a friend and in another time I would go alone and I would go to the beach, to the sea, in Tel Aviv, in Haifa, and I would talk and talk and talk. And if my wife would need my help, I would stay in the house and do the same six hours again and again. And for years on years on years, I wouldn't miss a night unless I would collapse and I wouldn't be able to leave the house, so I wouldn't. But I would sit and learn in yeshiva every day for 8 and 10 and 12 hours. I would learn 7 pages of Gemara every day. And I would learn few pages of Shulchan Aruch every day. And I was learning under that genius Rabbi Yoshua Cohen. For years in his classes I would come and hear his classes. And then I opened an English program in that yeshiva. And I was teaching. And I was teaching Gemara. And I was teaching Zohar. And I was teaching books of Rabbi Nachman of West of Likute Moran. And I would spend my life in the Torah and in the Avodat Hashem. But you know what? I was motivated from fear. It was not the love for Hashem that was pushing me to achieve those things. And not because that I don't love Hashem. The reason that I started my tshuva process was because I loved Hashem. When I realized that there is a shame in the world, my life being changed from one side to the other. Complete change. I was not the same person from that moment that it had been clarified to me that there is someone behind the curtain. When I realized that, in that moment, my life made 180 degrees change. And that's it. Full speed to the other direction. And every day until now, Every day and every day I achieved something else and I developed more and I grew up more. And I would drive to Haifa and I would drive to Meron and I would drive to Kiryat Shmona and I would go to this place and to that place and to the Galilee Sea, to the Kinneret and to deep over there and in the Mikveh of Rav Kook and in the Mikveh, a certain Mikveh. I saw that Mikveh in a movie. I saw a unique mikveh in a movie. I went to my car, drove two hours to, to Tveria. I, I checked online where is, the, what, what's, what, where is the location of that mikveh in the end, uh, uh, the title is in the end of the movie. I checked where that mikveh is located. I came, I knocked on their door. They said, look, the place is closed. There's no, only special occasions, only special events. I told them, listen. I came from Jerusalem. They opened the door for me. I wanted to dip in that mikveh. Crazy. But all of that brought me to feel, to recognize that something was wrong. What was wrong? That I've been pushed by people to do those things that actually were flaming and sparking and shining from inside. I really didn't need those people to do those things. Those things are the light of my soul. Those things are the natural light of my being. To learn to write something that I want to do. It's not something that I'm forced to do or supposed to be forced to do. When I am being forced to learn Torah, it's not the same learning like when I'm sitting and celebrating with that holy book, it's a different occasion. It's a different experience. When I'm going to the mikveh because I must to, because I have to, because I don't have another choice, that dip in that mikveh won't be the same like when I'm going from my happy heart to go and to purify myself, to throw myself under the holy water, to cancel my being, to nullify myself completely to Hashem. It's a different thing. 
Women are going to the mikveh, terrified from the balaniot. What they gonna say? How they gonna check? What they gonna tell them? How they gonna rebuke them? What gonna happen? Finally, once in few months, she's going to the mikveh and finding herself over there in the mikveh that she's so scared and terrified that she cannot even think about the mitzvah itself, about the opportunity. So now the religious world become to be a huge cloud that is blocking the light from the diamonds and pearls that are available for us, that are so easy to catch. What's the problem? You know as a man how great it is to go to the mikveh. Why? Because you just go and you let yourself be and you enjoy. And you find the right time. And you can dip how many times that you want. And you can spend some time thinking. But she, when she's dipping, every moment, kasher, 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 kasher. And if chas shalom, it's not kasher. Oh, they, the humiliations and the insultings. You're not checking what's that, what you have here, what you have there. Women are modest. Women are shy. Women cannot be inspected like that. So what? Oh, you're going to say, Dor Kasuto. Of course. That's the easiest trick of them all. Dor Kasuto. He's a missionary, right? Right? He doesn't want women to be checked in the mikveh. Right, of course. Why not? I want human to take care of human. I want women to care about women in the mikveh. I want that only women that are connected to humanity, to their emotions, to their feelings, to be allowed to be balaniot in the mikveh. That's what I want. I want that when a woman making her first steps to the mikveh, she will be welcomed with a smile, with a hug, with love, with patience, not with strict face, gray face, that is covered with anger and strict rules, and obligations that no one can fulfill and no one can answer and no one can keep. I want smiles. I want that when I am coming to learn Torah, the place of Torah will be a place of life. People will smile to me, even if I came with my jeans, even if I came with my long hair, even if I came without a kippah, even if I came with my piercing. I want my brothers to feel home when they're coming to visit me, even if they don't look like me. That's what I want. And this is why I'm telling you that the power that we receive from heaven is the strongest power of them all. Because we can wake up those souls to believe that who that they are, who that they've been created to be by the Almighty, is the most beautiful and magnificent thing, creation, that's been created ever before. And we're not supposed to change. We not just need to allow ourselves to be who we are. And this is what we need to fight for. Because if you will decide to be who you are, you're not going to fall off the derech. You're not going to stop putting tefillin. You're not going to stop keeping Shabbat. It's not going to happen to you. You are being terrified by people that are telling you that if you're not going to follow them and obey their commandments, you're going to fall off the way. But those people never been on the way. They never been on the pure way. They doesn't know what it means to have Shlom Bait. You know what it means to have Shlom Bait? I'll tell you. I have Shlom Bait. I can tell you. Shlom Bait is when the husband and wife, wife and husband, they feel complete happiness and joy and satisfaction spending their lives together. We have that. We love to be together. We cannot separate for a moment. My first tour to the U.S. was a disaster, was the worst thing I did for my life in the world you cannot imagine. First time that I fly to two weeks separated from my family, it was a disaster. 
Friday, I'm calling my wife and I'm crying for two hours, don't want to hang up the phone. Couldn't hang up the phone. First time I fly to Uman for Rosh Hashanah. Was a mistake. My wife, she was crying so badly. She was crying. She was crying for seven hours over the phone, only on one thing. How we gonna hang up the phone before of Rosh Hashanah? Seven hours and 2,500 shekels bill from Selkum in Israel. <laughs> and in a different year that I went again alone to Uman without my wife, I was not able to function. Why? Because I love her so much that you cannot understand. And she loves me so much that you cannot understand. And the Shekhinah is with us in the house. The blessing of Hashem is in our house. You can come to our house and to pray, and it will be equal to the prayer that you'll pray in the Western Wall. Why? Because there is Shekhinah in our house. And there is Shekhinah in the Kotel Amaravi, in the Western Wall. And if you don't believe me, come to our house, stand for a minute, pray, and you'll see salvations. People that are guiding you on how to have Shlom Bait with their wife, with your wife, and they don't have Shlom Bait with their wives, means that their wives won't stand and say the truth. I love him. I miss him. I cannot live without him. He's amazing. He's sensitive. He cares about me. If that rabbi doesn't have that wife, and not a phony wife, not a liar that will pretend for 30 years that she's married to that prince of I don't know what. Reality, bottom line, in judgment day, when Hashem will judge her, if that woman is a woman that is able to stand and to say, I am full of gratitude for being married to my beloved husband, go and be blessed by that man. If his wife been abused, been humiliated, been insulted, been rebuked. He and his students were talking bad things about her behind her back. So don't go to receive no advice from that person. No matter how people will crown him, no matter how people will, will, will um, title him, you should go and learn on peace from people that knows what peace is all about. Peace is when there is understanding and love and support. And if you still don't have it, you need to work on it. You don't need to go to your rabbi to help you to work on it. Your rabbi doesn't know how to do that. He doesn't have a clue. You should know how to do it. How are you going to know? How are you going to know? You don't know. You don't know. You try. A person, he likes chocolate. Now it's his wife's birthday. He wants to make her happy. He makes one plus one is two. Okay, what is making me happy? Chocolate. He goes to the store, buy chocolate, giving her a pack of chocolate. Here, my beloved wife gives her a birthday. She can't stand it. She's allergic. She doesn't want it. He doesn't know. He doesn't know who she is, what she likes, what she don't like. He doesn't know. But he tried to do the best. While checking who he is and what makes him happy, okay, that's the best recipe. No, it's not. The best recipe is to figure out what that you still don't know. How are you going to do that? You should want to figure out what she likes, what she thinks. When you're still afraid to hear her opinions, when you're still scared to sit and confront her opinions and her thoughts, you will never know which diamonds she is hiding and she is willing to give them to you and to open up to you and to give you everything she holds because she's holding it for you but for you when you will be worthy for you when you will be prepared when you will have the vessels as long as you don't want to hear the rebuke as long as you don't want to let her speak and express 
her feelings and her emotions, you will never going to hear what that is hiding behind her emotions. She feels alone. She feels sad. She feels depressed. She feels lonely. She feels terrified. She's lack of self-confidence. Her self-esteem is destroyed. She feels traumatized. Now you're coming and you don't have the power for all of that. Okay. It means that you will never break the wall that is separating you and your soul. Because a man and his wife are one soul. And every person in the world that will come to guide you how to be a man or a person that will come to guide your wife how to be a woman is making up stories. You need to figure out together how to run your life as a couple because you are one. No one can teach you about your wife. You should find your wife. You should recognize your wife. You should know your wife. Vayeda Adam et chava ishto. Adam, he knew his wife. He knew her. He felt her. He realized. Hashem is saying to Abram, listen to the voice of Sarah, your wife. Everything she's telling you, you should listen to her voice. He never told him you should follow her advice. He never told him you should do what she's going to command you. Never! He told him, Shema Bekola, listen to her voice. Why the voice? Because the voice is expressing the emotions. The voice is telling you that when she's screaming, I can't do it anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. There is something hidden in her voice. That if you will listen to the voice, you will understand the intention. The reason, the real meaning of her words. Sometimes she can tell you, I don't want to do that. And the truth is that she's just expressing, I want to do it in the right way. I don't want to do it in your bent and twisted way. I want to do it with honesty. I want to do it with satisfaction. I want to do it with connection, with truth. Not based on your fears and anxieties from people or from the world to come won't be rewarded over the crazy negative foreign thoughts. It's not the truth. You won't lack a thing in the world to come. Here today, I promise to every one of you, I'm giving to you my world to come. I don't want it. In front of Hashem, Hashem is here. There are books, holy books in the bookcase. I am testifying heaven and earth. Take my world to come. Take it. It's yours. What's your name? Nathan Ben? Yaakov. My world to come belongs to you. My world to come belongs to you. Belongs to you. Belongs to you. Belongs to all of you. Belongs to all of you online. I don't need it. I don't want it. Now I'm asking you. Do you think Hashem won't give me what He wants to give me? If He will want to give me whatever He will want to give me? Can you take it from me? Who can take the world to come from you if Hashem loves you? Who in the world will decree on you? Except of silly, ignorant people that are making up theories and blocking the eyes of our people from seeing the truth. That the Creator, His name is love. That His name is truth. That His name is the name of unity, of understanding. You want to be connected to Him? You need to be a person of truth. Means you need to be truthful. You need to have faith. So you need to be a person that people can count on. To be reliable. To be loyal. To be a person that is connected to the Creator is to be a person that is doing good in the world. And you will see that your inner desire for good will lead you to learn and will lead you to be purified and will lead you to teach other people and to make tons of charity and to help and to make and to build and to establish and to do and to make wonders in the world. 
Because that is the nature of good, to expand and to grow. And when you will attach yourself to the good, you will flow, you will rise, you will see. King David was a shepherd. What the difference between a shepherd to what did you do today? You're a shepherd. You're driving your car. You're working in your office. You're a shepherd. You do something. He was working. King David was working. He was sleeping in that barn, in that pen. Abraham was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. Simple people. Simple people. They were and they still are. You're going to see the face of Abram in the world to come. You're going to see the face of a holy shepherd. What do you think to yourself that Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, you're talking about a 39 years old kid from an Ashkenazi family that runs his life in the fields and in the forest, running away from his parents to the fields to cry and to call Hashem from the bottom of his heart. And Hashem uplift him to places that are above crown heights. Sorry for the bad joke. <laughs> Apologizing. Hashem gave the light of truth to the truthful ones, to the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh, to the Ari HaKadosh. The Ari HaKadosh spent eight or ten years of his life in a cabin in, on, on the bank of the Nile, on the river, alone. What's your problem? Your self-esteem is broken. You think you're not worth it. You think you're lousy. You're listening to opinions of messed up people that are messing up with your mind and criticizing you day and night and they themselves doing it only because that it's a pattern from their lousy parents that received it from their lousy parents that went through the Holocaust or I don't know which decrees and poverty if it's in Morocco, if it's in Iran, in Iraq, if it's in Poland, if it's in I don't know where. And they came with their background, they came with their cargo, with their scars, with their negative patterns, and they're now holding the book of Torah and claiming to hold the truth in their... Wait a second! Do you know who I am that you will judge me? Rabbi Akiva said, You should be careful to respect those ones that are coming from the poor families because the Torah will come out from their mouths. Why? Because Rabbi Akiva, he knew reality. Rabbi Akiva was only 40 years old when he started learning Torah. He didn't know how to read Aleph, the shape of Aleph, and Bet, he didn't know when he was 40 years old. 40! Then he started. Rabbi Eliezer Agadol, Rabbi Eliezer ben Orkenus, started his life of Torah when he was 27 years old. Now you will say, no, it's a different generation, different self-esteem, that's it. You don't understand that the Creator put, planted wisdom in his heart and in one day he became an angel because Hashem chose him and Hashem can choose you. Hashem chose Dvorah HaNeviah based on what? He chose Dvorah the Prophet based on what? She was making torches, wicks, for the light to illuminate in the temple, in the days of the temple. Amazing days of Mishkan. Wonderful. What was she doing? She made sure that there's going to be light for the learners, for the scholars, that when they're coming to learn, there will be light. She was an electrician woman. She was fixing the fluorescents. That's what she was doing. She would make sure that there's going to be light in the Beit Midrash when people are learning. And she became higher than Pinchas ben Elazar Kohen that was alive in that generation. He is Elijah the prophet. 
Dvora the prophet was higher than Elijah the prophet, the one that never died, the son of Aaron, the Kohen, the brother of Moses, the leader of Am Israel in Egypt. And he never died. But Dvora, she was higher in her level and she became the righteous of that generation because of the pure intention of her heart while making those torches to shine. Now what's your problem? Why do you think you cannot achieve those levels? Why? Because your parents molested you? Because your teachers molested you? Because your company destroyed your self-esteem? Because your brothers always called you jerk and stupid? Because of that? But they are liars. But they were not representing the truth. They themselves are broken people. It's a broken company. Broken people. Come Israel, Nathan. Don't be scared. What do you want? We have been twisted by people. And this is why Hashem is separating us from people today. And you're stuck with yourself and your iPhone and that's what you have in your life. And everyone are addicted to their iPhones and no one can forget his phone and everyone have at least one, one mobile in his pocket. Why? Because it's your salvation. It's not your prison. You still don't understand how the Creator works. That He makes a tunnel from the lowest place in your pit, in your prison, and that will be your outlet. That will be your lifeline. You will go down to hell and from the lowest place suddenly, wow! Why? Because you've been humbled like that. The Creator made sure that we will be completely humbled. That you will look at the mirror and you will see nothing in front of your eyes. Nothing. No Torah, no Tefillah, no Kedusha, no Halakha, no knowledge. At least let me have some money. No money. Nothing. No money, no wisdom, no right conclusions, no deep understanding, nothing. Look at yourself, no shape, no figure, no light, no beauty. From that humble point of view, from that low self-esteem, you can grow. Because the Torah is being given to us, to the desert, to the lowest mountain of them all. Only when you feel that you're dry like the desert, flat like the desert, nothing can grow out of you, no water springs inside of you, no salvation, only heat, burn, coyotes in the middle of the night, nothing, empty, empty, dry as the desert. Then, when you will receive the Torah, you will understand that you received it as a free gift. You will know how to appreciate the Torah. And I'll tell you a small thing about the Torah. The Torah is written with dark letters that have been compared to dark fire, black fire, on a blank white page. They've been compared to white fire. And the black dark fire is lower than the high and divine white bright fire that is holding the letter. Now the thing is that when you want to come and sit and learn Torah, what you will focus at, at the dark letters? What do you want me to read? Between the lines? Yes. That is exactly how that you will reach out to the light of your soul. Why? To the depths of Torah. Because all the knowledge that you learned, that you purchased while going and learning and opening books, that knowledge is physical even if it's talking about spiritual aspects. 
It's still a certain amount of sentences, of verses. You learned only in certain books and not in others. There are measures, there are weights. It's discussing a certain topics and not others. It's touching certain points. It's still limited. This is why it's lower. And it's all in your head. Depending the power of memory, capacity of your brain. But the white file, the conclusions, the deep understandings, depends in your heart. And your heart is deeper than you, than you can imagine. Lev Melachim en Cheker. People cannot investigate the depth of the heart of a, of a human being, of a child of the king. And when you loose it up a little bit and let yourself feel and go to the learning with an open mind, trying to enjoy the spirit of Mashiach, the spirit of Hashem that is hovering above the water, not depends in the water. You can satisfy your thirst from the spirit of Hashem. Not only on bread, not only on the letters of the Torah, not only based on how many pages you learn. It depends on the intention of your heart, why you came to learn, with which desire you came to learn. In that your learning depends, not in how many pages. I met such stupid people in my life that finished hundreds of books. Complete libraries they read. Ignorant. With no brain in their skulls. Nothing. Empty box. Empty boxes. Empty people. With no life experience. With no right conclusions. With no ability to guide and to lead and to take and to uplift and to inspire. What can they do? They can criticize and they can reject and they can judge and they can destroy the plantings of Hashem. Ibn Asher Alam, he woke up that poor guy in India in his trip when he was 20, the Creator with his divine supervision woke him up and with his colorful pants and with his tank top he's walking to the house of Hashem full of gratitude full of happiness full of inspiration he's willing to learn he came to nullify himself to the commandments of the Creator and in the door he will meet that panda bear the doorman that won't let him in. You think you can come like that to the house of Hashem? Do you know who he is? Start criticizing him. First time that I took courage to go to Mikveh in an Orthodox neighborhood in Jerusalem in Masharim, I was so scared and terrified because I was carrying three gigantic tattoos from my past. To take off my shirt in a mikveh in Masharim, you don't want to do that. I didn't want to do that. And when I did it, I've been slaughtered. I've been killed by one of the people over there. He starts screaming and humiliating me and insulting me. Why did you do that? Echa sita Lama sita Why did you do that? How could you do that? Why? It was higher than the mikveh. It purified me much more than the mikveh. I apologized to him. I told him I'm sorry. I didn't know it was not... I didn't know. I really didn't know. I didn't care about anything. I was 17 years old. I was so happy. I just received my new 500cc bike. I was on my way to the north. I already bought my drugs for the weekend. And I went to make a wonderful tattoo. What do you want? We were stoned that day. We didn't thought if it's allowed or not allowed. Who cared? I just made it because it looked cool.
cool. I thought to myself that people will respect me more, will appreciate me more, maybe women will like me more. I don't know. All nonsense that was going in the mind of a 17 years old kid that is making a tattoo. I didn't have deep intentions in it. <coughs> but it rejected me, that welcoming person from Mikveh for at least five months after that experience. And after it, when I went again and again to the mikveh, I was making sure to go with the towel on my shoulder to hide my tattoo. And immediately when I had the money, I went and I made those surgeries, laser surgeries to remove my tattoos. And on that, I'm doing more tshuva than on the tattoos themselves. I am doing more tshuva on removing those tattoos than on doing them in the first place. Because at least when I did them, I did it because I felt like it. I'm not proud of doing it, but I really felt that I, I was trying to build myself in a way, a twisted way, a foreign way. But at least I did something that I believed in, that I wanted to. But to remove them, I removed them because I was scared of people's opinion. And I was scared to be rebuked by people and what people will think about me. And that's the worst thing, worst sin than to make a tattoo. The Torah is telling you, you're not allowed to be scared of no one. No one will give you the advice and no one will give you the guidings on how to connect your soul to the truth and to Hashem. No one can guide you how to connect yourself to your spouse. No one can guide you on how to teach your children. The rabbis that were teaching my kids in school, I have five boys. And they were all, from day first, were in religious schools. The rabbis that taught all of my children are people that are not allowed to enter to the gates of school. I, if I would have the power today, I wouldn't allow them to enter to school. One, even, I wouldn't let him in. One. You know who are the rabbis that are teaching in schools today? Not everyone. You can find some amazing people over there also. Most of them are the people that will take as less money as can to work. The ones that will enter in the cheapest price, they are qualified to be rabbis. They are qualified to be rabbis. That's not fair. Not for our children. That's why my children are five years already homeschooled. And you know how much they've been taught in those five years? Much more than they learn in school. Much more. No one can guide you how to teach your children. You should want your children to learn. No one can teach you how to treat your wife. Not no fantastic book will guide you on how to treat your wife with honor and respect. You should want to respect her. There was a woman, she was the mother of, um, of Rabbi Ishmael Kohen Gadol, I think. And Rabbi Ishmael, he was a Tana in the days of Beit HaMikdash. And every time that he would come back from learning, his mother would wash his feet and would drink the water. And he start arguing with her. She was trying to respect him as a righteous holy man and she felt such gratitude for her son to be such a genius and a holy man that she would drink the water from his feet. And he refused to let her do that. What she did, she went to court. She took her son, that righteous man, Rabbi Ishmael, to court, to Beidin. And when she went to Beidin, she told them, my son is not respecting me. Wow, there was noise all over Israel. The mother of Rabbi Ishmael is telling that her son is not respecting her. They brought him to court. What happened? He said, look, I don't know what to do. She wants to drink the water. After washing my feet, she wants to drink the water. I can't let her do that. What was the 
psak, the decision of court, if that is the way that she is asking you to honor her, you must keep her will. Now, I'm telling you that no one can tell you what will be the right way to educate your child, to respect and honor your wife, to respect your parents. Why? Because every person wants his respect in a different way. And there's no one recipe. Flowers. My wife, she hates flowers. She likes them. When they're in the fields, oh, she loves them. On her Shabbos table, she can't. She cannot. She does. She never enjoys the smell and the cockroaches. She doesn't like it. I don't know. Weird wife I have. She doesn't like it. All the small germs and things that are falling from it while you're eating. I don't know. She doesn't like it on her Shabbos table. If I bring flowers, she won't like it. Again, how many times I heard that again you brought flowers, again you brought flowers. Some women, flowers are opening the gates for their happiness. Some women can't stand flowers. Getting allergies from flowers. What do you want from her? Poor woman. If you will want to respect your wife, you will find a way. You will learn how to respect your wife. It depends on your will. Not in the guidings that you will receive from your teachers. It depends in your will. If you want to learn Torah, it depends in your will. You will find the way when you will want it. If you will not going to want it, even if you will spend thousands of hours in front of open books, you won't learn anything. You will be an empty person because you don't want to learn Everything is going after the will. This is why when I'm teaching and guiding, I'm guiding people to find their own will. To find your own good will. What you want to do with your life. For sure that if we're Jewish, and as Jewish we feel connected to Judaism, and we feel like that's the part of our mission, to be observant and to keep to our mitzvot, it's the best thing in the world. Go and enjoy. I'm putting tefillin Rashi and Rabbeinu Tam. I'm learning Halakha. I'm learning Gemara. Now I'm in Masechet Brachot. I'm learning Halakha. Now I'm in Ilchot Tefillah. I'm learning Mishnayot. I'm also learning Mishnayot on Masechet Brachot. Today I learned from Likutei Moran. Today I learned from another book that is talking about stories of righteous people. I have a seder in the Zohar Kadosh every day. I'm, I, I, I'm not a missionary, guys. Really, I'm not. I'm just not a fake rabbi that is coming to demand honor from you. I'm your brother, and I'm your friend, and I'm coming to give you a hand from my life experience <coughs> and to tell you, don't give up on yourselves. Don't try to pretend to be someone you're not. Serve from your location, from who you are. With your family you need to serve. If it's bothering your wife, if it's too hard for your children, you need to find the golden path. That's the mission. The mission is not to learn and to daven and to do and to wake up and not to and yes to. No, that's not the mission. The mission is to find a shame in life. To spend every moment of your life in your interesting, colorful journey with the Creator, with our God. Not against Him, or under Him, or following Him, or running after Him, or afraid from His punishments and His decrees. Nothing will happen. Relax. And if something will happen, we'll deal. Big rabbis died from the worst sicknesses in the world. And the most evil people in the world finished their lives in so-called paradise, drinking and happy after slaughtering half of our nation in Brazil, in mansions, in front of the sea, died like, like ministers. Cruel, cruel Nazis finished their lives in wealth with gigantic families driving Rolls Royce and Mercedes. What you can, can you understand this world? No, so don't try. Don't try. And don't follow other people's fear that are terrorizing and terrifying you and trying to force you to follow them. Don't. 
be a free soul, an individual, keep your, your unique light, the light that has been given to you by Hashem, and go and serve Him out of those honest, sincere understanding of your will to do and keep God's will. Go try to find God in your house. Go try and find, find God while driving. Try to find God in your job. Try to find the will of Hashem from you. Why Hashem you send me to that family? Why Hashem you send me to this situation? Why Hashem you trapped me in that challenge? Why Hashem with that health, with that back, with that knee, with that thought? Why? What's the mission? What's the purpose of my life? What do you want from me, Hashem? What can I do for you, Hashem? That's the thought that you should go with and work with and find. And I'm blessing you on one thing, that your self-esteem will rise to the heights, that you will understand how precious souls you are, how great, fantastic and amazing you already are, are. Don't need to change. Just need to uncover, to unleash your truthful potential, your true potential, your light, the light of your soul. You are a soul. You're not a human. You're not a physical body. Your soul is trapped in your body. We passed our time, so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hashem will bless you, will answer all your prayers and requests. Amen, thank you, and so on. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this video very much. Please now remember to subscribe and like this video and share it with your friends to help spread faith in the world. For more, please visit amuna.com. May your light shine always and your requests should be answered with the greatest blessings. Amen.